And just one more welcome from me, Randy Vanderhoof from the EMV Migration Forum. Uh, we're going to get started in just one more minute. Uh, so there will be silence on the line here until uh, we get more people um, dialing in and uh, starting the webinar. So be right back to you. Okay, looks like we have a fair number of people who have uh, already connected, so without further ado, let's begin. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Randy Vanderhoof. I'm the director of the EMV Migration Forum, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Implementing EMV at the ATM. This webinar is based on a white paper that was recently published by the ATM Working Committee, one of six active industry stakeholder work groups operating under the EMV Migration Forum organization. During the webinar, please submit your questions using the Q&A window, and we will answer as many questions as possible uh, at the end of the hour. Uh, it's helpful if you submit your questions during the session rather than all at the end so that we have an opportunity to sort through them and uh, um, pick the best questions that we will have time to answer before the end. Also, I want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded for those who would like to review it later in more detail. And uh, before we begin with the content, I'd like to provide you with a brief introduction of the EMV Migration Forum and today's topic. So if we can go to the next slide. So the EMV Migration Forum was formed in August of 2012, actually nearly three years ago now, and closely um, after the, and closely after the four major brands announced their intentions to accelerate the adoption of secure chip technology as replacement for magnetic stripe systems and as an incentive for both merchants and issuers to make the investment in a timely coordinated manner to institute the fraud liability shift that would hold the party in the payments transaction which has the least security to be responsible for any counterfeit card fraud that was enabled by transactions that were not fully using chip technology. Today, three years later, we have more than 180 stakeholders who are participating in the forum. The members have formed working committees to address specific aspects of the migration, and one such group that was formed was the ATM work group, which is supported by members who recognized that the ATM channels needed to invest in security solutions at the same time as the in-store systems so that fraud does not just get shifted from in-store to those ATM channels. The focus of the white paper, which we'll be talking about in today's, in today's webinar, webinar, was produced, was produced by, by... I'm hearing I'm a bit hearing of an echo it. here, sorry. The focus of the, web, of the white paper they, um, they produced in this webinar uh, focuses on the changes in the ATM market and provides an overview of the available technologies that ATM operators can deploy to manage fraud risk while handling the unique aspects of our debit environment in the U.S. market. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'd like to introduce our presenters today, and we will begin with Mark Clevin, who is the uh, Senior Director for EMV Implementation at Visa, and Deborah Spidel, who is Director of EMV Solutions at Paragon Application Systems. So I will turn the microphone over to Mark. Thank you, Randy. Uh, welcome, everyone. In late 2013, it became clear to members of the ATM Working Committee of the U.S. EMV Migration Forum that there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about exactly what is required in order to implement EMV in an ATM. So members of the ATM Working Committee wrote a comprehensive white paper on this topic. Our goal was to create an unbiased resource that everyone in the industry could use. In August of 2014, version 1 of the white paper was made available to the public, with version 2 being published in June of 2015. You can access the white paper using the link shown here. The white paper includes an executive summary, a brief discussion of fundamental EMV concepts, an outline of the basic EMV requirements for ATMs, tips for migration planning, information about certifications, 
and some general considerations, along with recommendations and suggested best practices. For those who would like more technical details, there is also an in-depth discussion of EMV ATM transaction processing. As part of the executive summary, the paper points out the sections that may be of interest to those who only want an overview, as well as the sections which contain more details for those who want to dive deeper into various topics. In this webinar, we will talk about a few of the topics discussed in the white paper. The majority of our time today will be spent highlighting the major steps required to implement EMV at the ATM. We will also review the key dates for ATM owners over the next few years. And finally, we will direct you to some excellent resources you can use to learn more about these topics. But first, let's quickly review some of the reasons to migrate to EMV. Many countries around the world have already implemented EMV. As a result, the U.S. has become a significant target for counterfeit fraud. Visitors to the United States are able to use their chip cards at U.S. terminals because their cards have a magnetic stripe. But the non-U.S. card issuer may be reluctant to take a chance on approving a transaction that originated in the U.S. In order for U.S. cardholders and cardholders from other countries to use their cards everywhere successfully and enjoy the security benefits that EMV provides, it is important for the U.S. to support chip technology. Countries that have implemented EMV have experienced a remarkable decrease in counterfeit card fraud. As more countries migrate to EMV, those who have not migrated are seeing exponential growth in counterfeit fraud. This type of fraud will only get worse for those who delay their migration to EMV. In the chart on the left, which shows the United Kingdom, we see counterfeit fraud losses increasing as much as 46% in a single year. Then the tipping point is reached, where both the EMV issuance and acceptance in the country are such there is nowhere for the fraudster to go. Note that, as shown in the chart, this does not occur until some point into the migration, 2008 in this case, which means that the remaining non-EMV participants were bearing the brunt of ever-increasing fraud. In Canada, we see steadily declining fraud beginning in 2010 for domestic transactions, while counterfeit fraud using Canadian cards increases, often where fraudsters simply take their counterfeit cards to the U.S. EMV will protect not only against domestic fraud, but also against attempts to use counterfeit cards created using non-U.S. card information. A magnetic stripe contains an unchanging or static set of information. EMV supports the dynamic creation of one-time data, the key factor in fraud control. Dynamic data is also a key component in emerging payment trends, such as contactless and mobile payments. Implementation of EMV at the ATM will therefore support the interoperability of ATMs and smartphones which is an important step in the technological advancement of ATMs in the U.S. and other world markets. EMV technology was designed to make it vastly more difficult to create usable counterfeit cards. And while it cannot prevent a data breach, it will assist in the event of a breach by devaluing the data that is stolen. Theft of magnetic stripe data will not provide a criminal with the data they need in order to generate a legitimate card present EMV transaction. Theft of EMV transaction data will not provide the criminal with everything they need to generate a subsequent legitimate card present EMV transaction. The criminal will not have the necessary cryptographic key to generate legitimate EMV data for subsequent transactions. Any reuse of the dynamic EMV data from the original transaction will quickly indicate potential fraud to the issuer. And EMV transaction data does not have the same security validation code, CVV, CVC, and so forth, as the magnetic stripe that the criminal needs in order to create a valid magnetic stripe transaction. 
in a nutshell, remember that when an EMV card is used at an EMV ATM to create an EMV transaction, dynamic data is created unique to this transaction. Over 20 years of EMV deployment globally have demonstrated the security of EMV. Most of you are surely aware of the payment network liability shifts associated with EMV. Historically, the card issuer has typically borne the loss for counterfeit card fraud, but this will change. With the upcoming EMV liability shifts, liability for counterfeit card fraud will shift to the party that uses the less secure technology, in other words, the non-EMV compliant party. If a chip card is presented at a terminal that is not chip enabled, and the transaction is later determined to be counterfeit card fraud, the acquirer, and in effect, the non-EMV ATM terminal owner or operator will be liable for the loss associated with that transaction. This slide shows the key liability shift dates that are relevant to ATM owners. As of these dates, ATM operators will be exposed to the risk of counterfeit fraud if a chip card is presented to the ATM, but the ATM does not process EMV-initiated transactions. Note that the ATM must be fully enabled for EMV beyond simply installing EMV hardware. In the white paper, we review some basic EMV concepts that are important to understand as you begin your EMV planning and migration. The changes that EMV brings can seem overwhelming at first, but it's important to recognize that many things that happen in an ATM transaction today do not change with the introduction of EMV, including online PIN verification and online transaction authorization. The cardholder will still enter their PIN, the PIN will still be encrypted and sent online for verification by the issuer and the transaction will be authorized online as well. There are, however, some things that are different with EMV. First, the chip card must stay in the ATM for the duration of the transaction so that the card and the ATM can communicate both at the beginning and at the end of the transaction. While not noticeable for ATMs with motorized card readers, this will impact ATMs with DIP readers as will be discussed later. The online request message that is sent to the issuer will contain more data than it does today, and the response back to the ATM may contain more data than it does today. Message formats are changing to accommodate this additional EMV data. Therefore, certifications are typically required with the acquiring host or acquiring processor to ensure that the appropriate data is sent and received as per the acquiring network specification, and that the ATM is properly handling EMV processing. Let's take a closer look at an EMV transaction to see what is different from a magnetic stripe transaction. In our example transaction, a chip card is presented to a chip-enabled ATM. The chip card and the ATM will interact at the beginning of the transaction. The chip will use cryptography to generate the Dynamic Authorization Request Cryptogram, or ARQC, using new EMV-specific data, as well as various transaction data elements. The card uses a secure key to generate the cryptogram. The card issuer is the only party that has the key that can be used to validate the EMV data. By verifying the authorization request cryptogram, the issuer can be confident that the transaction was initiated by a legitimate card, since the chip card and the issuer are the only parties that have the key necessary to generate and validate the cryptogram. The issuer can optionally generate an authorization response cryptogram, or ARPC, to be sent back to the chip card. ATMs do not need to and should not process these cryptograms, but rather simply pass them on along with their validation data. 
The request cryptogram is generated by the card and passed through to the issuer for validation. The response cryptogram is generated by the issuer and passed through to the card for validation. The chip card and the ATM interact once again at the end of the transaction. This is why the card needs to stay in the ATM for the duration of the transaction. Now, let's cover a few basic concepts related to EMV. These are discussed in more detail in the white paper. One important new concept is the chip card application. This is a program running on the chip like MasterCard Cirrus or Visa Plus. The chip card application contains processing values and parameters that are associated with a particular product. Each payment network provides specifications that outline how their chip card applications must function. In EMV terminology, the acronym AID stands for Application Identifier. The AID is associated with and unlocks an application on the chip so that the data associated with that application can be used to initiate a transaction. Global payment networks such as American Express, Discover, MasterCard, and Visa have chip card applications and AIDs that are recognized by chip-enabled terminals around the world. These AIDs are often referred to as global AIDs. In the U.S., we also have domestic AIDs, or U.S. Common Debit AIDs, which are AIDs that satisfy business needs that are unique to the U.S. These AIDs are not typically recognized by terminals outside of the U.S. Each AID has a short descriptive phrase assigned by the issuer, which may be displayed on the terminal screen and printed on receipts. Refer to the white paper for a list of the AIDs that we used frequently in U.S. ATMs. The white paper goes on to outline the basic requirements for an EMV to support, for an ATM to support EMV. There are no specific operating system requirements for an ATM to support EMV. EMV will work with operating systems such as Windows 7 and Windows CE Though EMV offerings from a particular vendor may only operate on certain operating systems. In order for the card terminal interaction to take place, the ATM must have a card reader that can communicate with the chip card. The ATM vendor must ensure that the chip card reader has passed the mandatory EMV Co. Level 1 approval process. Note that while EMV upgrades exist for both DIP and motorized readers, it is not possible to upgrade a magnetic stripe swipe reader, which must be replaced. Each ATM must also have software, known as an EMV kernel. The purpose of the kernel is to support the commands and responses that are exchanged between the chip card and the ATM. The kernel works in conjunction with the payment application in the ATM. The ATM vendor typically provides the kernel and must ensure that the EMV kernel has passed the mandatory EMV Co. Level 2 approval. To be EMV compliant, your existing ATMs may only need an upgrade kit. This kit basically consists of a chip card reader and the software that will drive that card reader and integrate the new EMV components with your ATM application. Check with your hardware vendor or terminal provider to determine what is required to upgrade your ATM equipment and to verify that it is in fact upgradable. Check with your processor to verify that their processing platform has been or is in the process of being upgraded to and certified for EMV. Also, Check with both your manufacturer and processor to ensure that you have a complete and accurate list of AIDs to be loaded into your ATM so the ATM will be able to process EMV transactions for the payment networks appropriate to your business needs. A full list of AIDs commonly used in the U.S. can be found in the white paper. 
your processor, supported by your hardware vendors, will be able to recommend the exact components that you need, including the appropriate EMV kernel. In some cases, your processor may be able to identify EMV components that are pre-tested, reducing your testing requirements. And now, Deborah is going to review other key topics covered by the white paper. Thank you, Mark. The white paper contains a lot of information that will help you plan and successfully execute your EMV migration. For each ATM that does not yet support EMV, you will need to determine whether to upgrade it or replace it. With ATMs, upgrading is usually cheaper than replacing, but upgrading may not be an option in some cases. Contact your equipment vendors to check the availability and cost of EMV upgrade kits and options for your specific equipment. Your processor may also offer upgrade packages. If you're not quite ready to begin your EMV migration, but you urgently need to add or replace an ATM for another reason, make sure you purchase EMV-capable equipment. It's cheaper to get an EMV-capable ATM up front than to upgrade the ATM later in the field. You can add hardware before you need it and not enable it until you're ready to do so. Make sure that your vendor obtains EMV Co. Level 1 and Level 2 approvals. EMV compliance requires both the correct hardware and software to be fully functional, so make sure that your software is also EMV compliant along with your ATM hardware. Evaluate your installation and maintenance options now and determine your approach for updating all of the ATMs in your portfolio. Develop your migration strategy, including plans for obtaining parts, installation, and ongoing service, as well as replacing or upgrading hardware and software. You will need to make policy decisions related to EMV ATM requirements, such as which payment networks and AIDs your ATMs will support. Determine if there are any proprietary ATM requirements and whether your ATMs will support special functions such as pin change. Make sure you identify impacts to online transaction processing as well as clearing and settlement. Here are some key questions to ask your hardware vendor or terminal provider and your acquiring processor. Are you providing me with a chip card reader? Are you providing the necessary software kernel and any required integration of the kernel with my main ATM application? What AIDs do I need to support based on the network agreements I currently have in place? Are you providing support for the U.S. Common Debit AIDs? Does this support my current routing choices? What new EMV data might I want to log to the transaction log file? Has your platform been EMV certified by global and U.S. debit payment networks? And an additional question to ask acquiring processors is, do you offer a pre-tested package? EMV introduces some interesting new scenarios, which are covered in detail in the white paper. There are special considerations associated with DIP readers compared to motorized readers. If the ATM has a DIP reader, it will need the EMV component that allows the reader to trap the chip card and hold it for the duration of the transaction. This is important because the ATM needs to communicate with the chip not only when the transaction is initiated, but also when the response comes back from the issuer. If the magnetic stripe is read as the card is withdrawn and it is a magnetic stripe card, the transaction can proceed as it does today. But if it's an EMV chip card, once it has been withdrawn, the terminal must prompt the customer to reinsert the card and leave it in the ATM until the ATM prompts the customer to remove the card. This is sometimes called the double dip scenario because the chip card has to be inserted twice. Because the card is visible when using a dip reader, compared to a motorized reader, 
where the card is taken completely into the ATM and is out of sight, the customer may attempt to remove the card too soon, especially if they're used to removing the card immediately. Although the card reader mechanism will trap the chip card, a determined customer could potentially damage their chip card and the card reader by forcibly attempting to remove the card before the transaction is completed. Some manufacturers have instituted a delayed hold or a soft hold of the chip card to avoid this type of damage. In any case, additional screen messages and signage around the ATM are vital to ensure that customers understand the appropriate way to insert their chip card and the importance of leaving the card in the ATM until prompted to remove it and when to remove the card. Much of our audience will be familiar with the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, Section 1075, also known as the Durbin Amendment. This law requires that there must be a choice between at least two unaffiliated networks when routing POS debit transactions. U.S. payments industry stakeholders must comply with this law and with the introduction of EMV, the stakeholders needed to preserve the routing choices they have today. Initially, it might seem that the Durban Amendment has no impact on ATM owners and operators at all. However, U.S. ATMs will be accepting U.S.-issued debit EMV chip cards, so ATM owners and operators need to understand what AIDs may be on these cards. U.S.-issued debit chip cards that support a global payment network will initially carry two AIDs, one globally recognized AID from that global payment network and a U.S. common debit AID from that global payment network. This gives the acquirer the option to route the transaction to the global payment network that owns the global AID or to a U.S. debit network that has licensed that U.S. common debit AID. For cards that do not support one of the global payment networks, an issuer may license the shared debit AID from the Debit Network Alliance. It is important for ATM owners and operators to work closely with their vendor or acquiring processor to ensure that their ATMs support all of the appropriate AIDs that are needed to meet their business objectives. This could vary on an ATM by ATM basis. For an in-depth discussion of the U.S. Common Debit AIDs and transaction routing scenarios, refer to Appendix A of the White Paper. The White Paper also includes some suggested best practices based on the experiences of those who have been through EMV projects in the U.S and in other countries. In addition to the EMV Co. Level 1 and Level 2 approvals that will be done by the terminal manufacturer, additional certifications are required before an ATM is allowed to process EMV transactions in the field. Financial institutions that drive their own ATMs will need to talk with their payment network representatives to find out the requirements of each payment network. If you are an independent ATM deployer, you will want to speak with your equipment vendor and your acquiring processor to verify that all of the necessary certifications and operational arrangements and functions are in place to ensure a successful implementation of EMV. Payment network certifications only cover scenarios that are pertinent to the payment networks, so a financial institution or an acquiring processor will want to perform its own internal regression testing and new feature testing in addition to the required certifications. As we have already seen, EMV brings a change to the cardholder experience at the ATM, particularly when the ATM has a DIP reader. The card must remain in contact with the ATM's card reader for the duration of the transaction. ATM owners and operators should carefully evaluate whether new screens, messages, and signage will be needed, 
and find out what is available to assist with the new customer experience at the ATM. Optionally, there is an EMV chip decal available from EMVCO, which can be obtained at no charge. This decal can be placed on the ATM to indicate that the ATM is chip enabled. In some situations where the card supports more than one payment application, it may be necessary for the ATM to display information about the AIDs that are available and allow the cardholder to select the AID to use for the transaction. This topic is covered in detail in the white paper. The white paper lists several references and resources that you will find helpful during your evaluation and planning. There is a lot of technical content in the paper that we have not covered in this webinar. The technical topics that are covered in the white paper include a detailed, trans excuse me, a detailed description of the card and terminal interaction, a list of the AIDs that will be most frequently encountered in the U.S., and a list of the terminal action codes from many of the payment networks. In addition to the white paper, there are many other sources you can access for accurate information. The EMV Migration Forum website contains a great deal of information about EMV implementation. Each of the payment networks has information about their specific plans and requirements. Links to any network websites, along with additional educational material, can be found on the EMV Migration Forum's gochipcard.com site. The Smart Card Alliance website is also an excellent source of information, as are the websites for the ATM Industry Organization and the National ATM Council. Although the concepts and the terms we have covered in this webinar and in the white paper are some of the most common ones that you will encounter with EMV, there are many more. The U.S. EMV Migration Forum has published an excellent document that provides a list of common terms and acronyms along with their definitions. This standardization of terminology document can be downloaded for free at the link shown here. The EMV Migration Forum's Testing and Certification Working Committee produced a very helpful document that describes the current certifications for acquirers that are required by the major payment networks. The EMV Migration Forum's Debit Working Committee produced the U.S. Debit EMV Technical Proposal. This document is aimed primarily at POS acquirers, but may be of interest to ATM owners since it contains a lot of information about the U.S. Common Debit AIDs. Also check out the EMV Migration Forum's Knowledge Center. This resource provides links to accurate information about EMV from various reputable sources. Thank you for attending today's webinar. We encourage you to download and read the white paper. And now, back to Randy. Deb, and thank you, Mark. Uh, great presentation today. Um, we've got time for a couple of more questions from the audience, and if you would like to uh, submit some questions, uh, you can do so now through the chat box, and we'll take as many questions as we can uh, for the group. I'd like to begin with um, with Mark and uh, just ask a, a kind of a follow-up question about the progress that's being made in the United States. And will most of the ATMs be chip enabled by uh, October 2016 when the liability shift happens? Well, good question, Randy. A uh, couple things. So I will note that the uh, MasterCard liability shift is in 2016 and the Visa liability shift as well as some of the other, uh, the U.S. debit network liability shifts are in 2017. Uh, I, I think there's a bit of a difference between whether we're talking about uh, numeric or by volume. Uh, because what we are seeing already, in, and we've already seen uh, transactions coming from chip-enabled ATMs today, uh, but what we're seeing is a focus on ATMs that are in areas where there's a lot of international cards. 
we're seeing a focus on um, just high volume ATMs, a focus in areas where there traditionally is a lot of fraud. And uh, so I think there'll be a targeted focus and I think the volume numbers uh, will grow faster than the uh, percentage of ATMs converted. I don't have any official numbers yet. There's a number of people working on that. Um, but I, I can say if you go into the uh, MasterCard ATM locator service or the Visa ATM locator service, uh, you will see there's ATMs uh, flagged as chip capable. And if you counted them up, you'd run up, you'd see there's roughly about 8% physically of uh, ATMs today that have been uh, fully in EMV enabled. So they have the hardware, they have the software, and they're in fact turned on for, for all the brands. Thanks, Mark. Deb, do you have anything you'd like to add? Thanks, Randy. Uh, in some recent discussions with some of the large uh, financial institutions and the, the people at those institutions working, actively working on EMV migrations, um, I have learned that the vast majority of the largest financial institutions in the U.S. have made amazing progress. As Mark said, there are a large number of ATMs in the country that are chip enabled. Primarily, they started in areas with high tourism and high numbers of cross-border transactions and high counterfeit card fraud rates such as New York City, Miami, and Orlando. So those areas are getting well covered and the migrations are moving forward quite rapidly across the rest of the U.S. Thanks, Deb. Uh, so maybe just as a point of clarification, one of the um, submissions or questions that came in um, was with regard to whether or not the changes that are required for CHIP, whether that's being mandated um, by the brand or whether that is still part of a voluntary um, decision by each uh, ATM operator um, based on the motivation created by the liability ship. Either one of you can answer that question. Well, I'll start because Visa does have a mandate for some of the ATM uh, acquiring processors to convert their systems to support chip just to make sure there's no barrier to anyone who wants to convert at any time. Uh, but in terms of uh, the ATM deployers, it is not a mandate. It is a liability shift. Uh, they will be subject to um, counterfeit fraud liability as of the dates that we showed earlier. Great. Thanks, Mark. Right. Um, I think it's important. Yeah, go ahead, Deb. Thanks. I think it's important for each ATM owner and operator to uh, make their own business case and assess the uh, pros and cons of migrating to EMV and needing to understand uh, what are the potential ramifications of not doing the migration. It, and actually, that, that's a great point, Deborah. And I, I would even add to that, you know, to take into account the factors that we've discussed. You know, is there a lot of uh, cross-border traffic this ATM? Is it in the high uh, fraud area? Um, is it near uh, large cities that are currently undergoing EMV migrations, uh, which will help prioritize uh, the deployment and upgrades of, of the ATMs? That's an excellent point because one of the things we are seeing is that in some of these larger metropolitan areas where the large financial institutions have made such great progress, the smaller community banks and other institutions are already seeing an increase in counterfeit fraud at their non-EMV compliant ATMs. Okay, uh, Deb, I think this question is yours because it has to do with uh, what you discussed with the handling of the common AID. So that given that not all ATM vendors are ready for the U.S. common AID, if as a processor we send the U.S. common AID to the ATM, do you see any problem with that or do we need to wait until the vendor is ready for U.S. common AID? Okay, I'm, I'm going to answer the question the way I think it was meant. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand exactly the way it was phrased. But if the question is should we configure the ATM to support or try to configure the ATM to support the U.S. Common Debit AID before our vendor is ready to do that, that might be a challenge because their logic is going to be needed in that ATM to process the U.S. Common AID correctly. 
and we go into that in a great amount of detail in the white paper. I'm not going to expand on that here, but you need to make sure that your, your vendor is, is able to support that, that your um, software kernel and the, all of the surrounding uh, logic around that are able to handle the US common AID before you um, are going to be able to process that successfully. And the, go ahead. And I was going to say, I might just take that back to the basic business question. Uh, you know, we're getting into AIDs, which is a bit technical. The, the basic business question is, is you know, is, is this ATM going to continue to support my business needs that I have today, which includes the ability uh, of routing to different networks and how it gets handled underneath the covers, I mean, depending on the level of interest of the deployer. But in some cases, the deployer just wants to know, is this going to support my business needs, support chip, and support my current business needs. And, and that's where the vendors and the acquiring processors need to say yes. OK, great. Uh, this next question is, is kind of general in nature, and it's about um, educating the general public on EMV introduction and, and the cardholder's experience. Perhaps you could uh, answer also in terms of specifically what their interactions at the ATM um, are going to be like, and is there a organized plan for um, educating the general public on how um, EMV is going to be impacting them at the ATM? I can start with that if you like. As part of the communication and educations working group within the EMV Migration Forum, we're very aware of the change, potential change to customer behavior at the ATM. Now, if the ATM has a motorized card reader and the, the customer is used to inserting the card and the ATM takes that card into the ATM and you really, as a cardholder, don't know what's going on inside and then it returns it to you when it's finished, you really won't see any difference. But with the DIP reader, there is potentially a bit of a, a difference there. So as part of the Communication and Education's Working Committee, we are definitely uh, looking at this and working on educational materials uh, for that. I know that the card brands are also doing a great job uh, with um, information on their particular websites so that anyone can go to, for example, the Visa website or the MasterCard website, and there's some really good information out there as well. And the EMV Migration Forum is putting out some amazingly good information on the gochipcard.com website. Thanks, I think Deb. Deborah's answered it, yeah. Mm. Uh, Mark, I think this next question um, might be related to you. Um, Um, will any fraudulent uh, transaction cases be treated similar to Reg E claims? In other words, will the funds simply be debited via ACH from the vault cash account? Not quite sure what that question is. I'm hoping you can answer. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm not overly familiar with the uh, process from the, from the Reg E side. Uh, I do know uh, I can speak for um, I think I can speak for most of the brands at least uh, in terms just because of uh, presentations I've heard elsewhere as well as I know what Visa does. Um, so essentially it would be handled as a as a chargeback standard chargeback process. So we wouldn't be changing that process. The uh, money is actually uh, if the, if a chargeback is successful that it's actually the acquire that is the bank of record sponsor bank of record for that ATM will pay for the funds and then whatever their contractual arrangements are between the sponsoring bank and the ATM operator will determine then uh, how the bank gets their money back. Okay. This and is a good topic uh, though because people do need to Sorry, people do need to talk with their payment network representatives about any potential changes regarding fallback, not fallback, <laughs> chargeback, because there could be some new uh, codes, um, reason codes, and things that they'll need to be aware of when they're submitting chargeback requests. Okay. <clears throat> um, Deb, I think maybe you can answer this question. There was a mention about uh, customers selecting which AID to use during a transaction. 
will a, a regular customer know how to make that choice? Oh, this is such a good question. And Mark or I could talk about this for hours, but we won't. Um, we go into this in a lot of detail in the white paper, and, and the short answer is that under most circumstances, the cardholder will not be prompted to choose the AID. This is a very specific circumstance having to do with cards that you probably won't see in the U.S. for quite some time. That would be cards that have particularly uh, like both a debit and a credit application on them, and the cardholder would be asked to choose debit versus credit. But that's something we probably won't see here for a while, and so for the most part, customers are not going to be uh, faced with that decision, but there's a lot of information about it in the white paper if people are interested in finding out more. And, and I would add that the code that Deborah referred to earlier for the common AID processing is code that jumps in and and evaluates which AID should be presented to the cardholder, where there really is only one source of funds associated. So with, with the scenario that Trevor talked about earlier, common AID and a global AID on the same card, those are really pointing to the same source of funds. And so this new logic that comes in is described by various EMF papers uh, does in fact address how to deal with that without getting the cardholder involved in the decision. Right. Um, here's a, a usability or a user education question. Um, since ATMs have two different types of readers, the DIP style reader and the, uh, the card capture or insertion reader, um, if a MagStripe holder goes to an, if MagStripe card holder, meaning one that doesn't have a chip, um, goes to an EMV enabled ATM, um, do they have to leave their card in place like they do a chip card, or will they be able to dip or remove their card like they use their current card, or in, the current, in their older machines, I should say? Yeah, the goal would be for the uh, magnetic stripe card holder to not see any difference in their behavior. So what they're used to doing today, they will still do uh, tomorrow, even if that ATM is chip enabled. That's the goal, anyway. Yeah, Deb, could you just explain the logic between how does the ATM machine know that that's an EMV card versus a MagStripe card? Oh, sure, absolutely. And we do cover this in the white paper as well. Um, there's a on the track too. You have a lot of information in there. Then, and uh, one of the things that's in the in the track two data is called the service code. In the first position of the service code the digit there uh, is going to represent, well, this was created as a magnetic stripe card or this was created as a chip card. So when the card is first presented to the ATM, the ATM is going to look at that value, and if it sees that it's a magnetic stripe card, it's going to process the transaction just as it always has, business as usual. If it sees that it's a chip card, it's going to attempt to read the chip. And by reading the chip, the instructions would be to reinsert the card if it's a DIP style reader. If the customer has removed the card uh, from the DIP reader, then the ATM would need to display a message saying, please reinsert your card and leave it until you're prompted to remove it. <clears throat> okay. Um, either for Mark or Deb, on ATMs will fall back be available, fallback meaning if the chip is unable to be read and perform the ATM transaction, will it um, work with the MagStripe uh, data? I'll, I'll jump on that. So to start with, the answer is yes. Um, I'm a little cautioned because different payment networks may come to different decisions over time, but right now uh, we all allow it. and. Uh, that can, in the motorized world, that's invisible because it's inside the ATM and the card can be uh, re-read or, or the original MagStripe read can be used. Uh, in the DIP reader, uh, kind of the same thing. Um, if, uh, you know, hopefully it was, if they maintained the original MagStripe read and the original DIP, then uh, they can automatically fall back. Let me, I will caution that some of the brands are monitoring. Visa is one of them that monitors for excessive fallbacks on, on chip cards. And so it's not, we, we, we do want it to be an exceptional scenario and not 
one that happens commonly. Right. Okay. Um, anybody want to take a question regarding contactless acceptance um, at the ATM, like Apple Pay? Do you anticipate that there's going to be that capability soon? Uh, soon is a good question. Um, you know, obviously, the world is doing a lot with contactless as the foundation for mobile. Uh, Apple Pay is gaining in popularity. Uh, I will note that in Australia, for example, where mobile became very popular, grocery stores and gas stations and so forth, that it did inspire the ATM deployers to implement uh, contactless and support for those mobile um, processes. So I think the th I think the thing that will kick it off in the U.S. is when you start seeing it for contact with some mobile for daily spend, really seeing it at the grocery store, really seeing it, say, for instance, at the gas stations. Uh, it's probably around the corner then that, that the ATM operators will want to start offering it to their cardholders and will begin to expect it. I, I don't think it's tomorrow. I mean, it's just not that widespread in the, in the grocery store and daily spend space today. So I, I don't think it's urgent. I, I There are significant additional impacts of putting a contactless reader in, a, in an ATM. And if it, you know, if it was easy to do, if you could easily add a card reader, contactless card reader, I'd say fine, but I, I wouldn't let it interfere with your EMV migration. Okay. Deb, anything to add or are you good with that? No, that's a great answer. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so uh, an another question with regard to programming or inputting the, uh, the uh, AIDs into ATM machines. Maybe you could kind of explain um, how that happens and whether or not that's something that has to be done by manually visiting the ATM machines or can that be programmed um, remotely? Uh. I, th I think, the, unfortunately, I think the answer is all of the above. To some degree. It depends greatly on the on the uh, vendor. Uh, some vendors are actually deploying machines with like everything in there, um, and then they just offer some means of turning off the ones that aren't being used. Uh, other ones uh, I've been hearing require a site visit. Uh, it's fairly simple menu once you get there, but it very much depends on on the brand of the machine. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions here. Um, do you foresee large card issuers blocking or policies declining MagStripe transactions in the future, meaning after the liability shift date? Oh, well, I'll tackle that one too. It's a sensitive uh, topic, but um, what I will note is that what we have seen um, I, I know that today we see a pretty significant difference between chip cards from outside the U.S. when they're presented at a MagStripe ATM or when they're presented at a, a, a chip card ATM, the approval rate from the chip card ATM is significantly higher. Um, so it, it's uh, probably you need to be really careful about quoting numbers, but let's say it's probably more like 50-50 at a MagStripe ATM, whereas it climbs to kind of a normal uh, rate that we would normally see today with MagStripe in the uh, 90s kind of percentage. Uh, so there's a pretty, there is a difference. There definitely are some issuers who are quite conservative and concerned about when they, when they see, when their chip card is presented at a MagStripe only device. Okay, uh, let's see. I think we have one more question here. Um, is there a published list or any uh, information available um, on which um, finance institutions have upgraded their ATMs uh, for EMV? The only thing I'm aware of is the ATM locator that Mark mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Visa website or the MasterCard website and so forth and look for ATMs by zip code or address or whatever, you will be able to find out um, what ATM it is, and uh, but I specifically myself. They may be out there. I just haven't seen them. 
yeah, the locator is the only public information I'm aware of. Uh, I will note that uh, I, I know with the visa, and I believe with the MasterCard locator, you can actually specifically request uh, chip card ATMs. Yes, you can. Okay, great. And and this last question, um, I think I'll answer myself, and that is um, the white paper that we've been referring to, has it been reviewed and, and approved by the payment brands, meaning Visa, MasterCard, North Express, and Discover? So um, we follow a very tight policy within the Indian Migration Forum that any of the work products produced by the working committees um, need to be submitted for approval by the steering committee. That steering committee has representatives from all of the major payment brands as well as the major acquirers, processors, merchants, um, and, uh, and industry suppliers. So um, the material in the white paper is factual to the best of our ability and have been reviewed and approved by, um, by all of those, those parties uh, before it was released. So I think we're pretty confident in the information. However, we use as a disclaimer, things change and policies change, and we can't comment on specific uh, companies' um, policies or even interpretation of policies. So uh, it is best to check with individual services providers um, on specific questions that may be presented in a more of a general, general format. So um, I'm going to wrap up the Q&A session now. And uh, just as a final conclusion, I uh, want to make everybody aware of uh, the URL where you can go and uh, actually uh, download the white paper. So uh, the link is on this final uh, document here. Uh, thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Please uh, visit the emv-connection.com website for many, many more valuable resources that relate to the U.S. EMV migration. Uh, consider joining the EMV Migration Forum organization if you are uh, an active stakeholder in the market and want to stay abreast of the latest changes that are happening and, and be in contact with the key decision makers that are making the migration happen in the U.S. And uh, look forward to future webinars and materials that um, are produced um, by the EMV Migration Forum and the Smart Card Alliance. Thank you again to, uh, to Mark Levin and, and Deborah Spidel for your excellent uh, content. Uh, and again, thank you, audience, for your participation. Just as a final closing note, um, we did say that the presentations would be available after the webinar. It takes us a little while to get the recording and the webinar content uh, uploaded on the website. But since you registered online, we will send you an email confirmation with those details. And uh, it usually takes about a week to get that information out to you. So um, please be patient. But feel free to contact us if you feel you missed some communication. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. And I look forward to participating in future events with the EMB Migration Forum.